trying to provide um, some degree of official enablement and support for a broader set of distributions than just sort of the couple big name enterprise commercial distributions that everybody pretends to know and love and or hate. Um, and in the process, talk just a little bit about sort of the evolution's led us here. But um, first off, out of curiosity, um, how many of you, how many of you have never heard me give a talk somewhere before? There are a few of you. Okay. Well, well, very, very quickly then, just so you know who I am and have a little bit of context. Um, I tell people I made my first contribution to what we now call free software in about 1979. It was a piece of assembly language for a microprocessor, which was obscure then and is now completely forgotten. Um, but it led me down a sort of interesting path of <coughs> what has ended up being a, a fairly long and for me a, a really interesting career of, of doing things in, in the free and open source world. I've had the privilege for the last wow, almost 10 years of serving as the chief technologist for open source and Linux at HP. And what exactly that means is probably just as much of a mystery to me as it is to you. But um, it, it means really that I've had the opportunity to help influence the way the company thinks about uh, free software and more recently open source. And that's really important because HP has become such an incredibly big company with what's with such a large footprint in the worldwide IT space. And I'm pleased that on the whole, I think the company behaves reasonably well around free software and open source projects. And I think we've actually managed over the years to have you know, very positive influence on a bunch of different projects. Um, I'm, of course, you know, showing my colors today, not only because Debian's a big part of my personal history, but because this is a big weekend for us. Um, <coughs> but the, the, thing, the other thing to sort of put in context, I, I did go borrow a couple slides from my marketing guys, and I hope you won't be too offended by that. But I don't think everybody understands, um, because our marketing guys aren't always as good about getting the message out as they could or should be, that you know, for more than a decade, HP has been the largest seller in the world of Linux servers and related kit. Um, we have not always been the folks talking the most about Linux or even, in fact, making the biggest investments in free software and Linux development. But we have now consistently for more than a decade been uh, market leaders in all this. And part of the reason for that, I believe, is that we have taken what I think is such a and sort of a genuine and honest approach to trying to understand how to work within our community development processes and uh, have ended up as a consequence uh, enabling all sorts of things that we might not otherwise have, have felt able to do. Um, now, of course, <coughs> um, another marketing slide. <laughs> 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 Just because, though, we are doing things that are sort of unique within the big server hiring industry to try and provide support for non-commercial and other community distributions, I don't want you to think for a moment that we don't also do all of the things that big, mission-critical enterprise customers want to have us do in order to be you know, the, the, the most successful supplier, distributor, and supporter of commercial Linux distributions. We do that. We are, in fact, very strong partners with Red Hat and Novell. I chose the, the Red Hat slide because it's a little crisp. Right? There are a lot of things we do. It's led to you know, great benchmark results. It's led to, to you know, um, strong commitment uh, from various companies and the ability for lots of customers who want to run really big uh, commercial applications on top of Linux to be able to do that. But in the fall of 1986, we did something a little unexpected, I think. Um, we had for years, not just because of my position and involvement, because of, but because many other people in HP had also discovered and been working with Debian and with other non-commercial distributions. Um, we found ourselves in a situation where when customers asked for it, we looked around at ourselves and realized that we really could provide the same kind of commercial support offerings for the Debian distribution that we had been providing 
for uh, Red Hat and for Novell, uh, SZA, and to a lesser extent, some other geographically specific distributions prior to that. We'd done some press releases with the HMX folks, for example, but that was all very geographically constrained. Now here it is, what is it now? It's four, almost four and a half years later. To the best of my knowledge, we're still the only producer of big iron servers that provides official support offerings for a distribution that isn't a major commercial distribution. And this, to me, is something that I'm still you know, very proud of. But it's expanded a lot since then. <coughs> Today, there's a whole sort of range of distributions that HP provides some degree of official support and or enablement for. And internally, these get thought about as, as very much being distinguished between commercial distributions and community distributions. You can get picky about what that boundary really means, but inside the company, it's a useful way to think about them differently. And what it really has to do with is a combination of what sort of non-HP badged human resources and money and other things are available to help push the results of the work forward, combined with how do people think about it and what do they actually want from a company like HP. So when we talk about a commercial distribution, these are partnerships. <clears throat> this is where there is some company behind a Linux distribution that HP can engage in sort of all of the normal business dealings and business relationship mechanics with. They can do joint marketing things. They can you know, work on you know, <clears throat> all sorts of, 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 of things that make sense to uh, people who are used to buying commercial uh, proprietary operating systems. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of customers who tell us, we just want to buy your hardware, but we want to know before we buy your hardware that it's really going to work with our distribution of choice. And that ends up being kind of a difficult thing to do, because if you're going to spend the time and energy to go and test a particular distribution on a pile of hardware, that requires an investment of time and manpower and other resources. And if there's no direct mechanism for generating revenue from that activity, if you don't get to sell some support contracts or something at the end of the day, how do you justify this? How do you quantify what the return on that investment is? And you can't just say, we'll sell a few more boxes. Because everybody who makes what they think are, and customers seem to believe, are some of the world's best industry standard servers, believe that they're going to sell those servers whether they do, they do that work or not. And so <clears throat> internally, the process of figuring out how to justify doing the extra work that's required to be able to validate that you know, community distributions do in fact work on our hardware, and to be able to provide even some lightweight support for building things like the client support packs for distributions that weren't already part of the official support roadmap has been a really interesting challenge. And I'm just really tickled that over time we figured out how to do that. And part of it is because we ended up establishing what I think are some very strong relationships with um, key contributors to, to different community distributions. So what comes out of this other than just the notion that we put a logo up on our website and sort of imply that if you run that distribution, we'll still love you, um, is that HP actually produces these things called client support packs. And what they, it used to be that these were important because they contain device drivers for our hardware. They mostly don't contain device drivers anymore because one of the things that we've very successfully done over the last few years is to upstream all of the interesting drivers that are part of making the, the cool extra value-added hardware on HP's ProLine server work. And so uh, today it is the norm that people running uh, Linux of any distribution on an HP ProLine server can do so with an untainted kernel. That didn't used to be true. Yeah? Why do you provide the uh, libraries in the ProLine I'm sorry, what? Why do you provide libraries in the product? Because of library version schemes. <laughs> well, you could, uh, sorry, uh, 
the Los Devils slash Ubuntu package broke the SE LD so cold. Yeah, yeah, the directory. I freely admit that there are bugs in the stuff that's been shipped, and those guys keep working on it, and over time it gets better. It's a heck of a lot better now than it was a year and a half ago, for example, where we were still shipping 32-bit executables in the AMD64 support packages for most distributions. Um, yeah, well, you know, it kind of worked most of the time. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been very interesting because um, one, one of the things we discovered is that there was quite a bit of build machinery that had been put in place over time to build the set of officially supported distributions, support nodes. And the folks who had originally built a lot of machinery were not around anymore. And so part of it's been getting people to be willing to commit enough human resources to go unwind some of the dependency chains, figure out why it is that we're doing things the sometimes crazy ways they were doing before than before, and, and actually go rebuild some of that infrastructure in a way that does the right things for modern distributions. Um, there are folks that are you know, still hard at work trying to get all of those things right, but I would argue that every time there's a new PSP release, they seem to be getting better. And if they don't seem to be getting better, gee, it's a bug, tell us, and we'll go try and figure it out. Yeah. And if you're not getting a good response from the normal support channels for those things, my email address is pretty widely published. Um, so anyway, I, I do want to point out that there are a couple of more or less official channels for providing feedback about what's in these PSPs. Today, it, they mostly have things like management agents and um, user space demons that will do things like help monitor the health of the server by uh, using the drivers that are in the kernel to interpret some of the information coming from the, you know, the baseboard management processors and so forth. <coughs> um, you know, I would love in a perfect world if all of that stuff could be 100% open source, but the reality is some of these things are things that continue to be you know, points of differentiation for the company. So these PSPs have optional user space demons that you can run if you want to be able to take advantage of some of the capabilities that are in the hardware. Today, to the best of my knowledge, none of those require tinting your kernel, which is a huge change from a couple of years ago. And then um, I do want to point out that, that feedback that's come in through either HP's IT Resource Center and the forums and discussions uh, groups that exist there, or you know, for the last year and a half or so through the linux.org uh, site that we put together that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, uh, those have actually influenced our thinking about how to prioritize some of this work and, and how these things have gotten delivered. So don't think that we don't listen, because we really, really do. And when I talk to the guys in Houston and Paul Collins who do a lot of this work. The biggest request they had of me was please figure out how to get people to give us more feedback on what's working and what's not because they would just love to hear from me and to figure out how to make things even better. So the community Linux.org site, how many of you know about this or have been there? A few? The rest of you should take a look. Um, <clears throat> The objective in creating this site was to create a place outside of HP's own IT infrastructure and all of the sort of behavior and process rules that go along with that, where people could collaborate in a very open community kind of way uh, to talk about what it takes to make Linux work well on the vast breadth of products that the company produces. And in fact, we'd be completely happy to see people talk about <coughs> other systems and servers there as well. So I think the behavior that's kind of come out of all of this is everybody sort of knows that HP started this and HP sponsoring it, and so it mostly ends up being HP systems that are talked about. This was introduced at uh, LinuxCon in Portland in 2009. Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's not a really huge site. It's not competing with CNN.com or something like that for attention. But the fact that there are 30 to 50 unique visitors per day, just day in and day out over time, um, suggests to me that this really is um, seeing some views. And recently, we've started being a little more outreach oriented. <coughs> Uh, with the with the knowledge that we were getting close to a release of Debian Squeeze, a couple of weeks, three weeks or something ago, one of our co-workers in HP put out a, a request there that uh, customers who were interested uh, go try the, the, the beta release um, Debian and Squeeze installer stuff and, and let us know if there are problems with it. 
on uh, the Lion systems. Uh, the good news is that actually there aren't. In fact, I got feedback directly from a friend last night who was sitting up, well, it's tonight here, it was still daylight in the U.S. He was in the process of installing a squeeze on some new uh, DL380 servers, and the combination of the much cleaner handling for firmware objects for devices that need uh, firmware blobs and uh, the ease with which you can now create a USB stick to install from and things like that, it was all just working great. <clears throat> and I'm hoping that he will, I, I go to him a little bit um, to, to go actually and post his recipe for doing this and we'll see whether that happens. If you do take a look at this site, I, I think that sometime soon there will probably be a survey that's posted there. We're very interested in trying to understand whether people think this site is really useful, and if so, you know, what it is that's good about it, and if not, you know, what we ought to do differently, because <clears throat> this is certainly something where we're trying to sort of, you know, have it be a place where people can come together to collaborate and share best practices. And you don't have to depend on sort of, you know, the randomness of the, the results that come back from a Google search or something to figure out, you know, how to make things work on particular hardware. So if I were going to summarize all of this quickly, I think that the most important factor behind our ability to do this is the really, really simple thing that we've been pushing on for years, which is if you want to support Linux on hardware well, the thing you have to do is get all your drivers into the kernel.org tree. If you do that, the rest of this gets really, really easy. <coughs> and in fact, one of my big concerns for the future is that we are now in a situation where, as I said, you can run an untainted kernel and be completely functional in the vast majority of HP server products, but, we are moving into a period in time where product development teams are staring at the you know, processing cores and the flash memory and the RAM that they're putting on I.O. cards, and they're staring at the ever-increasing core counts on the central processors, and they're thinking about the bus bandwidths that are available between the processors and the I.O. devices, and they're scratching their heads wondering why they're still downloading firmware to a lame little processor out on an I.O. board. <coughs> and I don't we tend to suggest that there's some huge switch that's about to be flipped here. But I think over time that unless they somehow come to believe that the value added associated with some of these I.O. devices, like RAID controllers, for example, that unless they come to believe that that's all best contributed into open source space, we could very easily find ourselves backsliding into a situation where proprietary content starts percolating back up from below the firmware boundary into things that they want to have run in the, the main processor's uh, memory address space. And if that happens, then all of a sudden, you know, <clears throat> I, I get very frustrated because it will feel like a lot of progress is, is being lost. I, I don't know whether this will really happen, but as I watch sort of the tea leaves being strewn and, and the, the forces that are at work out there, I worry that at some point we end up in a situation where just handling firmware binary blobs <coughs> isn't going to be sufficient. We'll be back to messing with. I think we've already been there. You've had the wind modems and windows printers in, 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 in the past. And yeah, but when was the last time anybody cared about a wind mode? I mean, Actually, yeah, okay, but I mean, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the reason it mostly failed was because People also realized, to some extent, that I mean, if you, if, especially if you have this on, on systems where, where speed is important, that if, I mean, if you have, have uh, if you if you use your process for, for device driver for, for for doing more device driver work, that will also uh, that be, requires you to have faster process and, and it's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, yeah but, 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 but you got to think about the economics of this. If we can take some number of dollars out of an I/O device and we're all to the point where we have servers, even even inexpensive servers that have what, 120, 128 threads of execution, right. you know, and, and we're several yeah, several doublings shy of where I think the core count thing is going to settle down. Um, yeah. you know, transistors on the main chip are getting really really cheap compared to anything that's sitting out on an I/O card, both because it's a separate, more expensive development environment. You know, anyway. Yeah. I don't want to spend a lot of time dwelling on this. I don't want everybody to walk away saying, oh, BDL thinks the world's going to backslide and it's going to get worse. I just want you to understand, one of the things that keeps me awake at night is figuring out how we avoid ending up in a situation where we take steps backwards and we maybe someday end up not being able to run any untainted kernels again because of these sorts of economic forces.
substantial, important intellectual property buried in their bio system. Um, I, I'm very carefully using the word they here because it's not an opinion that I completely agree with. But um, as long as they continue to believe that, the probability that they will move to you know, a more open bio strategy or some other booting strategy uh, seems small. In fact, the trend that I see is that the industry across lots of architectures is as likely to converge on EFI style boot mechanisms as anything. And that that is a trend that now has lots of momentum behind it and is unlikely to change short of some major miracle. So, you know, for better or for worse, I think that's the world we're heading towards. I think it's a better world than the world of sort of legacy PC BIOSes for a lot of reasons, but it's certainly not the future I would have chosen if I got to pick the answers for it. Okay, yeah. Because you were talking about notebooks since your uh, the whole slide is about servers. Yeah, yeah, that's the part of the business I actually get most of my Yeah, do they also do work on uh, laptops or not? Yeah. We actually ship more notebooks with Linux preloaded on them than anybody else in the world. The problem is that the vast majority of those go into geographies that you and I don't visit very often. <laughs> there, there's, there's no chance of this changing? There is every chance of it changing, but you have to think about what it is that would actually cause it to change. Right. What would cause it to change is a radical change in the request slash demand rate from customers. I've talked before in other venues you know, over the years about the, the very strange economics when you start talking about very high volume products. And you know, I, I don't remember what the numbers are, but it's something north of 40 million quote unquote PCs that HP shipped last year. And so even though the number of machines that we ship preloaded with Linux is huge by comparison to any of our competitors, uh, it's still just a drop in the bucket, and the problem is it's spread across a bunch of different models and a bunch of different product lines. So trying to find any single place where you would look and say, oh, that's the product that you really ought to you know, put on the shelves at Best Buy and you know, you know, Virginia City with the, with the preload on it is tough. Having said that, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on. Um, in case you hadn't noticed, we acquired Palm. <coughs> WebOS is part of HP now. Um, WebOS. We acquired Palm. You know, the people in Palm OS and WebOS. And yeah. I will leave you to ponder what that might mean for the future. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to hint at the fact that you're not as confused about it as you might be. But <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of things happening. There are a lot of really interesting things happening. And I don't believe the world's in any way, shape, or form static. In fact, I think there are all sorts of exciting you know, things that we're mulling over, any one of which could be you know, major news items in the coming months. But um, we don't ever talk about things that aren't always joke. At least, not without a lot more beer than we can get in the drinks. <laughs> any other last questions? Then we should probably finish up. All right, well, thank you very much for your time and attention. I will be
case from what uh, Hans spoke about. Uh, if there is no upstream and uh, no, uh, nobody is really actively developing it, then it, uh, it's obviously a good idea to create new upstream if we find uh, enough people to do that. But sometimes, uh, well, we need to backport fixes that we, uh, well, we as a distribution that doesn't uh, throw away new versions. Uh, and uh, we uh, sometimes uh, upstream is not dead, and they are releasing uh, new versions, but they just don't want to fix some things that yeah. we all agree on. Yeah, on some level, it must just be a difference in the way we think about or approach these problems, and I'm totally okay with that. I, I would just comment that in my own workflow and thinking, even when there's a currently active upstream, the very first thing I want to do with every piece of source code I get anywhere near is bring it into a good distributed revision control system so that I can stop dealing with all of that old process baggage about you know, trying to keep track of which patch is which and how they're supposed to overlay, um, particularly in the, in the Git universe with branches being really cheap and commits being atomic. Um, you know, just life is so much simpler than it used to be. Yeah. Um, somehow, fundamentally, uh, if the consensus of the distributions uh, is at this point, upstream is making it wrong. So the consensus distribution is we all need to have this change. Roughly, distributions are saying, hey, we need to have a spork uh, 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 yeah. a kind of kind of fork that keeps very close. But and then, well, we are kind of extreme. Yes. So, yeah, no, that, so I think the point is, um, it's, yeah. instead of uh, collecting patches, is um, we're really collecting the whole source code, the whole source code version, um, and having real branches and stuff like that instead of patches. But um, yeah, one, one problem with that, um, with that approach, um, I mean, uh, what what, uh, what you have to. Um, what we have to do when when we do something like that is um, the um, for example the git level is then uh, not enough in a, in and out of itself because um, it can be very difficult to extract from a git history the information uh, which changes belong together and for which reasons they were made and maybe then unmade later and stuff like that, you still need uh, to have um, yeah, some kind of description of, uh, of a change. So it's, you still, it's I think still useful, I think, to think in terms of patches. Um, as the, the one type, atomic... It's uh, also, also a matter, of course, of writing proper change line. Yes. Yeah, but, but you still have to... Um, we all agree, I think, that we have to figure out how to get this information out of the minds of the individual maintainers of different distributions so that it can be effectively shared. So, so on that part, I think we all agree. It's just what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Yeah, if we use a bit to track uh, all these patches, uh, we can obviously do... Uh, Correct uh, commit messages. Uh, well, it might be just that I don't know much about uh, Git. Well, I know, of, of course, I know Git, but uh, maybe I don't know it well enough. But I think that uh, with uh, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult to track uh, these patches if they're changed in one branch to make it. Uh, Fast, fastly appear in all other branches, and uh, I think it might be easy to forget about change that uh, happens to one branch if you are not following it very closely. You need, um, I mean, yep, that's what I try to say. Um, I mean, to maintain a set of changes to an upstream um, is. Um, it's, it's not trivial, you need to do it right. Um, so you have to define 
procedures for that, but it's possible. And I think um, when you do it right, you get more value than you have with patches, because uh, a patch is always just um, a two-way diff. Yeah, you have the before and you have the after. But um, if you have correct branching and uh, well, um, a good version control system, you have uh, all the um, possibilities of three or more way um, comparisons. So you can, so that for example, you can apply a patch really to different versions, even with small changes, because the version control system does that for you. But you, um, I mean, we don't talk here about uh, one branch per distribution. I think we're more talking about one branch per patch. You have to really have topic branches for each patch so that you have uh, any possibility of keeping track of them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think we're getting a bit technical now and a bit into low level details. I think that's what we need. What we all agree on is that we want to do more sharing. Yes. I think that something like Harvester, if the made to, to take patches from the, say, top five distros. That would be great, that I can just as a maintainer of one, one distro go look there and see patches, or maybe even the top 10 or top 100 distros, whatever. Uh, that would be a very good start, even though it's just at the patch level, because that's what I currently also do. If I have a problem and it's, it's not trivial to fix, I start looking at what other distros do. But now I just go to each and every VCS manually by myself. So it would be a step upwards. I'm not saying it's, it's the idea went, but... Um, well, if, you, if what you did was coalesce a set of references to commits and various distributed revision control systems, and that's what you mean when you say patch, then my brain might unexplode <laughs> and be able to handle this. But um, I've spent too many decades living in a world where people pass little atomic objects around as if they were really atomic and called them patches and you know, loved and cared for them way too much. and. I don't want to live that way again. I, I'm so pleased to have gotten past that. But when we start talking about this and we start talking about the you know, naming of patches and so forth, I, 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 at this point, I really sort of do react in a, in a, you know, I have a, I have an allergic reaction to, to having the conversation end about up. taking care of all the patches. <laughs> yeah, so <sighs> let's just not do them anymore. But yeah, sure. But that's also why I advocate for new stream. I mean, even yes. I mean, this is something we already disagreed about on uh, on email, which is exactly why we're doing this together because there are multiple angles to the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is uh, if you have an upstream, well, we're obviously having an interesting conversation. That's the good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the point of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. Bringing yeah. up the conversation. Right. right. Yeah, to have a discussion. But what I was trying to say, what what you were saying, was uh, sort of, is if you have an upstream which refuses to unbundle libraries or even add a configure option to not use the bundle ones, etc. Maybe we should use our, our, our right to fork. I'm sure that a lot of upstreams, if, if the top three or four distributions get together and say, we're doing a fork, because you are not listening to us and we communicate clearly, this is a lightweight fork, we're going to track your changes, we're going to apply our own patches, because you're stubborn and we cannot use it this way, they might come around. I mean, if I'm just saying it's, I'm mostly saying it is me, Maybe on behalf of the Fedora project, but not really, I'm just saying it as me. But if all the distros get together and say, we do a four, like happened with Go OO, until, uh, of course, it became LibreOffice, but that's because uh, the upstream was really, really stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, in, in some cases, it might also help to just do a, a lightweight four to send a message. It's a lot of work for sending a message. But if that's necessary to get the message across. Well, it, it, does, it does come back to the other part of what I wanted to comment on, which is that the interesting thing about when you start talking about how we need to add more metadata around patches to make it easier for other people to understand, at some point you have to ask yourself, what's the motivation for somebody to want to add more information, more knowledge, more documentation than they actually need to do the work they're doing for their own distribution? It's all well and good to say, well, you do a little bit more for this, and I'll do a little bit more for that. And it's all not about uh, adding more information that uh, they are already doing for the distribution. It's uh, about, uh, well, we all uh, document somehow what the patches are for, but uh, everybody does it differently. So if we could agree on that, it would be easier to find. That's, that's the only point in uh, defining these things. 
And, at, uh, at some point to me, the notion that somebody just decides to be a new maintainer between the upstream and the individual people working on it, you know, I start wondering at what point somebody just has to say, okay, there needs to be some human brain involved here and not just a tool. But I, I, I'm not trying to disagree or object. I'm, I just, I should shut up. I'm just thinking about it. It's good at that. Okay. Well, <coughs> actually, my idea uh, what we should document it was uh, start with uh, Debian patch policy and maybe add a few things and uh, make it uh, more thick. I think I read it and uh, sometimes it says uh, if there is uh, no, it means something, and if there is everything else, it means something completely different. I saw examples, and it was, uh, I, mean, I think it was about upstream, that, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, in the policy, it wasn't clearly written that there is, uh, it has to be in, uh, in what, uh, what format does it have to be if it, was upstream or something like that. I don't remember really the, de the details, but uh, I know that uh, there was. Uh, it was uh, easy for a human to understand, but um, if somebody misunderstood the policy, uh, it might be hard for automat or some robots to parse it. But uh, basically, and since there is no uh, common archiving system for the game security, we have to uh, store this information outside of the uh, archiving system. So it means, uh, for instance, most of the packages, it is the upstream server having the patch uh, inside. We keep the patch because we don't have common archiving system like we have in the uh, Regarding your problem, uh, with the patch and the, all the metadata. data, I really have the impression that you need the patches and you had, uh, need also meta, uh, meta, meta data to keep uh, kind of patches. The, what's the difference between your patch and the history and the metadata uh, and another branch in archiving system? Maybe it's a solution for your problem. You uh, would need to have an archiving system like this, have a main branch which, uh, which keeps uh, a stream part. Have another branch with uh, common patches uh, usable by, by each distribution. Have one branch per distribution, and then you can synchronize uh, the different branches uh, between uh, the common uh, separate branch, which is middle be a middle one between the working with the screen and the complete core, and several branches for uh, all the distribution. Then you would have a branch for a dedicated uh, distribution work, one common branch for the uh, for distribution work and the old current which represents the steam stream for you. And then you have a chain and a stream, you can integrate it in your main track and then uh, migrate the patches from main track into all the other trains, into, uh, into all the other branches, which will be interesting. Maybe that will be a solution to the problem of sharing patches between the streams. This, well, it's, it's very similar to what we, this is very similar to what we do now. Um, I, I maintain several packages for Debian where the upstream source tarball is not DFSP mm -hmm. compliant. And so I always bring those in and check them in to an upstream branch, and then I have a processing script that automates the maintenance of providing the portions that are non-free out of the upstream to create a, a pseudo upstream which then becomes the source for the upstream source protocol in the WM packaging system. And so this is very much, I think, similar to what you're talking about, because I'm in effect creating a sub-distribution of the upstream thing. And I'm doing all of my you know, maintenance work against this new pseudo upstream. And there's really no reason that other people couldn't share that, that we couldn't yeah. have you know, some planning out. Probably everybody else is doing something similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, certainly if they care about freedom. But yeah, that's a whole other question. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, not, not about, uh, well, yeah, yeah. not about uh, getting rid of uh, that uh, thing that uh, aren't really yeah. Yeah. So, so my, about, uh, uh, so I, I would just suggest that, that, that I think we do have some some practices and uh, some best practices around how to do this kind of sort of multi-branch management within 
get, it's starting to work in other distributed revision control systems. It gets the one I know and love. And uh, I, I think these could be applied very straightforwardly, particularly with the easy ability that Git gives you for managing remotes, where it's easy to, for, for me to have in my revision control system a branch that represents your current latest work that I can keep up with and cherry pick patches from and so forth. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. What uh, we came to uh, when when we were talking about this uh, presentation, we put it on the post them distribution list, and we and other people came in. So what we what we didn't know about and uh, turned out in the discussion were that. Uh, uh, well, basically, people like the idea to collaborate and to, to work together, and uh, things were. Uh, we found out that there is also already some uh, free desktop uh, wiki pages about uh, how to access different uh, version control systems in different distributions and how to contact packagers. It's quite uh, general, and uh, it can uh, use some work to make it uh, more usable. Also, we found out that uh, one thing that uh, Hans already talked about was that it might be interesting to create some means how to contact uh, maintainers of all distributions for some package or not really package, maybe some category of packages. I think everybody has a KDE team in their distribution or no team. And uh, if Upstream doesn't provide uh, some mailing list for packages, we might be interested in creating one and documenting this list. So if some new distribution came out, they will know uh, what main list they should subscribe and where to discuss packaging of that particular application they are interested in. Also one thing that uh, we all know that uh, might be useful is that uh, we all name our packages somehow and uh, we name them as our policy are and we've got different policies regarding this and it would be very useful to have something that will map a package name from one distribution to another distribution and actually uh, on the mailing list we found out that there are already two applications that are trying to do that so they want to use it for the app installer too uh, I think uh, that's uh, when the discussion came up. Uh, it came up from uh, up, in, up installer. Yeah. I think that even the app installers, that they use the name from the desktop file, and that distribution should not change the name in the desktop files. And that the uh, desktop file will be provided by upstream, so that one can also search for the name, which is the name as it's listed in the desktop file. I believe, but I'm not sure. I don't know that much about the app installer. But this this match is uh, used mainly for applying Debian tags in other distributions. Well, so I think that's that's, that's how the reason. That's how we intend to use it. But yes. I, I guess the goal in the long term would be to use it to do much more than that. Yeah. So uh, that was all my presentation, and uh, well, the rest of uh, the time for our. The session is uh, reserved for discussion. We already had some. Well, obviously, most people don't really like the idea of uh, maintaining patches. I think, uh, well, maybe uh, who of you would like to, well, not really like to, but uh, is there anybody who would prefer to share patches instead of creating some common, common uh, version control? And uh, I mean, I think the only the um, 
the, the appeal of uh, um, just extracting patches and collecting them is the um, initial work is much lower. I mean, you yeah, can do I that think, with I think, I like, think. Like, something like, I guess, uh, the normal, normal, normal server, low end, and if you want to create a git repository for each package, uh, you better start with a, with a big machine, yeah, because you will need a lot of disk space and stuff, or, and process, processing power and stuff like that. So um, extracting patches is like uh, a work that leads to fast rewards. Um, the question is whether it's worth it in, in the long run um, to yeah. try to well, go for a good solution. You, you seem to be implying that it's necessary to have a centralized repository of all of the bits. And that is, in fact, exactly counter to the whole sort of point of the distributed provision control model. A centralized database of pointers to the locations of the different distributions, distributed revision control system repositories for a given package, on the other hand, would be both relatively cheap to maintain from a system overhead standpoint and immensely useful. What I would love to have is not so much a if we're going to create mappings of things, then I would love to have the VCS location information for each of the distributions that's actually keeping that package in a distributed version control system, whether it's Git or something else. Yeah. Because that that kind of information, that that's the set of pointers that you really need to be able to set up a set of remotes yeah. to point to those things and all of a sudden have visibility to what everyone is doing. The problem with, with that is that uh, although, for example, Fedora has switched to using Git for maintaining uh, uh, its packages, within Git we have a spec file in the bunch of patches. And Git is tracking the version of the patches, not of the entire exploded sources. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll we, that. We, we are working, or some people with it, I should say, I'm not, not involved. Some people have ideas about really putting exploded sources into Git, so taking the upstream cargo as main branch and then what you were describing basically yeah. and using that, but that, that is not how RPM works. That we can get work around yeah, that probably. Yeah, that's why we use RPM, but we don't have to have that way <laughs> <laughs> And, um, but that's also a problem is that uh, a lot of people who work with Git who are not developers, packagers are not always developers. We are talking about patch sharing, pa packages would need a lot which need a lot of patches, and most of the maintainers there within the distros are actually developers, or coders, or whatever you want to call it. While a lot of packaging in distros with 10,000 plus packages is done by sysadmins, sort of, kind of. Not that it's a really clear distinction, of course, but you, you, you catch my grip, I hope. Uh, and I'm not sure if we're going to make things more complicated by having by having a distributed version control system, which has a steeper learning curve. What's that going to do to all those packages which just want to package some tool which they need and think the tools will have in a package, but which are not really coders and not really used to working with distributed version control systems every day, etc. So within Fedora, it's probably going to, we are, or a group is working towards this direction, but it's probably going to be an opt-in thing, where some packages will say, okay, I want to have my entire sources in Git, and others will just keep doing their old stuff, only using kids to have a spec file and a bunch of patches. I think that would cause you to be in the same situation as most other distributions. In Debian, for example, you know, the, the, the source package is the thing, and how people create and maintain those is very much a matter of no, we, we don't want to go there because you have 16 different formats, but... <laughs> uh, that's not true. <laughs> but, um, I mean... Only 55. <laughs> <laughs> there are only three so the, problem, the problem with, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I understood the problem of in, of English. <laughs> um, if you share repository, if you have each distribution, have their own repository as... Which they will anyway. Without any way today, uh, how do you communalize the part that is fixing bugs um, or fixing documentation that is common to all distributions? Um, I guess that's what is very important to share among these, amongst distributions, just the same fix base, the uh, same base of fixes that 
such as Fedora, OpenSUSE, uh, so, Debian, and so on, to not reinvent and retry to find the correct fix. So we can have so, a, a so large the review of the fixes. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I completely understand. And we're pretty much out of time. But my quick answer to that would be that the moment we need to have something more informative than the commit messages associated with each of the individual patch commits, we then really are talking about having a human who is responsible for that in one way or another. I don't believe that there's any simple mechanistic way that you're going to separate things which are distribution specific from things which are things you wish upstream would take but hasn't taken yet. And lacking the ability to do that in a fully automated way. The question then is, should the burden be on the person who wants to take that you know, from me for things I've done or from you for things you've done, or is that burden going to be accepted by somebody else? And if that burden is accepted by somebody else, that somebody else has just become the intermediate maintainer who is somewhere between the individual distributions and the original upstream. And so to me, this is less a question of technology and more one of who, who's going to volunteer to do the work. <laughs> but I think you had a beautiful sentence when you said that when we all have patches which we would like upstream to take, but they will take. I think that something which we need to get better at as distributions is uh, strength is in numbers. So just ganging up on upstream, <laughs> to put it bluntly, <laughs> and just say, we, we, the maintainers of this package, and this and this and this and this distribution, would really like you to see, do something about this point. If you don't like our patches, fix it in your own way, but just fix it. Yeah. Because in the end, I think there's much more to be gained. Because what we want to do is we want to have all these bug fixes done only once. The proper way to do that is to do it upstream, wherever possible. Wherever possible. And there are other things that refuse. Yeah, but th that's why I'm saying strength is in numbers. Yeah. Because currently what happens is every distribution is having the discussion with upstream by itself. So the simplest the simplest piece of advice from this whole discussion, which I don't think anyone would disagree with, is if you maintain a piece of software for a particular distribution and you don't already know the people who maintain that same piece of software for all of the other distributions, you are failing and you need to go meet those people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also a good ending for this presentation. Yeah. Thank you all for